uh, congratulations to, it's great to see this many people hang on. Uh, I, will, I will, with the ego I have after that introduction, if you leave early, I'm just going to know it's a plane. It's got nothing to do with the content of this session or the panel. Uh, we have a great panel of people to bring up on stage in a little while. I've learned from past experience, you never put a panel up early and leave them there silent. Because it feels like they're in a kind of, you know, they're about to be shot or they're a jury for a court or something. So we'll bring the panel up in a bit. Um, the other thing I've learned over and over again, and, and you all know this, is this, in this day and age, if you have a conference and all you get to do is sit and listen, that's a bad thing. Okay, so I want to encourage everybody in the audience to start thinking about, you know, what are the questions you want to ask us? I want you to get in. This is going to be a discussion. I have questions for the panelists, but I think your questions for the panelists and for me are, are the, going to be, I know they're going to be the best questions. I just went to get a cup of coffee and a guy strode up to me and had this fantastic discussion point that we hadn't thought of. I'm like, you need to grab the microphone and, and ask us that question. So this will be informal. Uh, we, will, we will roll with it. Um, we have some great topics to cover, some great questions to dig into, um, but I really do want to see this overall as a discussion. But let me, let me kind of give a context uh, for that as we get our last few folks in here. This is, this is my, if you talked about telling a story, this is my story of the sector. This is how I see it after, I mean, really more than a year of thinking about it, but, but definitely a year of working with many people in this room many people within the North American Forest Partnership. This, and when I say the word sector, I want to be very, very clear that I don't just mean industry. So the sector for me is it's the industry, and this is true of the partnership, that includes a pretty broad section of people from across the industry. It includes uh, what I call the acronyms, right? You know how many acronyms there are in this sector, in this community. I'm not going to list them all off. We have a long list of acronyms of industry associations, lobby groups, but we also have uh, the Nature Conservancy in our partnership. We have about 30 nonprofits. Most of the, the leading forestry schools are already members. So it's the whole community. It's not, it's not just the industry when I talk about the sector. I use those terms uh, interchangeably. But if you look at the history of this sector over the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, it used to be much more integrated and much more vertically integrated as an industry, as a sector, correct? Right? Many of you work for companies that used to do all of the things that now all these different composite companies did. And when that was true, it made sense to do more communications to tell the story around things in a more comprehensive way. So there was more of a voice for the sector than I believe there is today. As it disaggregated, as it became, okay, these people own the land, these people own the mills, these people do the, you know, this part of it, these people sell the screws, as someone just said to me, right, there's, there's, there's people just selling screws here, screws and not just screws, what do you call them, fasteners or something, something much more complicated than just, I know they're not just screws, I get that, okay? Um, so, I know I'm going to be meeting with the screw people now, right after this meeting, <laughs> god damn it, you fastener folks doing a great job out there, okay? But you get the point, right? This is the point. They're talking about just fasteners, and they should be, right? If, you, if your job as a communicator, if you work for one, if, you work, if you're a landowner, it's about the land. If you are working for a mill, it's about the mill. There are very few people, and there are some people in this room, who really recognize that they should be telling the whole story, as I call it, instead of just part of the story. And you should be telling just part of the story. That's your job. But what that does is it does create a vacuum that gets filled. If you're a, and i sorry to use the B word, if you're a brand strategy guy, I call it the B word for people who just like, oh, brand strategy, I hate that stuff, okay? But if you're a brand strategy guy and you look at that situation, what you're gonna see is a vacuum. And whenever you leave a vacuum, this is just human nature, somebody has to fill it. Someone has to say, okay, well then this is who the forest sector is. And for better or worse, we have left that vacuum there for a while, and it has been filled with all sorts of messaging. Some of it's positive, some of it's great, but a lot of it has been pretty negative. Um, and, and you can just, just when we started using this, this phrase, Forest Proud, for example, right, we go to the membership and say, hey, we're going to use Forest Proud. We're gonna use, that's going to be the identity, the banner of this group. And people are like, ooh, I don't, I don't know if you can do that. I, I don't know if that's a good idea. I don't know if we want to say we're proud. I'm like, really? Are you proud? Yes, absolutely. Very proud to be proud. Okay, so you are proud, but you don't want to say it. 
Don't want to say I'm proud, okay? And, and I understand that. I think there's good pride and bad pride. And we actually had, uh, he'll remain nameless, one of the members quoted us, Bible chapter and verse on pride comes before a fall. I said, yes, it does, okay? But are you proud to be part of the sector? Raise your hand if you're proud to be part of the forest sector, right? You should be proud. I've sat with all of, you know, most of the people in this room or most of the people I sat with, and I listen to what you do. I listen to the fact that you've done this for generations. I listen to how hard you're working to be responsible stewards of this resource. I listen to how much you've had to learn to do what you have, and I'm, you should be proud. You should be damn proud of what you're doing. But for all the reasons we know, we haven't really been able to sort of put that story out there and say, how, say that we are proud of it. So, so if you take that context, then you say, okay, how does mass timber fit into that? Right? Why, why, do I, why do I think this, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it with Craig sitting right here, this is the, I've been to the, I've done the full year of forest sector conferences, and with apologies to everyone else who runs conferences, including us, this is the most exciting conference in the year right now. This one right here. Why is that? Right, why is this the most, I think, important and exciting conference that happens right now in the sector? Because this is the story, right? If you wanna tell the story of this sector in a powerful, compelling way, mass timber ticks every single box you wanna tick, right? We, we, it's got a great environmental story. It's got a great story about rural economies. It's got a fabulous story about people's health and buildings that we heard about this morning, right? And I know the science is there, but you don't need the science. If you go and stand in a mass timber building or a mass timber office, you, you know that you feel great working in the environment. So it's got that part of it. And the list just goes on and on. It's an it can be an amazing story about how we manage our forests. It can be an amazing story about innovation and the technology that we're now using, and an amazing story about a great sector to come and work in. I just keep ticking boxes when I think about mass timber. It tells that story for us. But that doesn't mean we can't mess this up, right? That doesn't mean that we can't, for every story I just mentioned, there's the potential for opponents to come in and reframe that. There's the potential to overcomplicate that story. Just take carbon for a second, and we're, I know we're gonna talk about carbon, and Nicole and Thomas and others will come up here and we'll talk about carbon. Carbon seems to me it should be the, the simplest, one of the most fundamental stories we get to tell about forests, but in the last five years, that story has just got more and more and more complicated. Now it's quite a hard story to tell. Is, it, is carbon good? Are we doing well or are we doing badly? If we're, you know, I don't know, is it Tuesday or Wednesday? I can't quite tell because this study came out and then that study came out. Then you throw biomass in the mix. Is, is it good? Is it it's just complicated. And it is a complicated story. We need to understand this complicated story and get to the bottom of it. But if you try and have that discussion in the public eye, it just, they just click away. They're just gonna switch off. It's too complicated. All right, so how do we tell the mass timber story in a simple way that is effective? I think that's essential. Um, to do that, a number of things have to happen. There's key research that has to happen. We have to align the message in good ways, all sorts of things that we can do uh, to do that really well while at the same time, behind the scenes, making sure we understand what are the details behind carbon, how do we understand that? So I think there's the story that's already out there, there's the story that we want told, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that's gonna have to happen behind the scenes to make sure we get our story right. Um, and that's what all of those things we wanna dig into in this panel today. So, with that, let's bring our panel up We'll start asking them some questions. Start thinking about what your questions might be. But Nicole, Tom, we've got Mike. I haven't seen Mike yet. Is Mike here? Nice, Craig. Little, mu little music while they walk up. That's good. Uh, so Thomas, if you want to come up. Mike, Nicole, and has Jim arrived from TNC? Oh, great. Well done, Jim. Sorry, I was staring right at you. And we have a bit of a microphone challenge. Is this one on? I can't tell. You, Nicole, yeah. say hi in that one. Hello. Very it's ooh. <laughs> that was a very good hello, okay? And we'll sit you guys here. Okay, I need to go there. Okay. I'm gonna sit you guys either so side there. That's mine. Okay. I need a clicker. Hey, we've, it's very smooth. It's the last session of the conference. It's all good. Yeah, exactly. We should be handing out the beer at this point. Um, and we'll dig into this discussion. 
maybe we start with, let's start with you, Mike. Um, and I'm going to ask each of you a question. I think I've kind of answered this question myself. So Will, Forest Brown, the North American Forest Partnership, I want you to answer, so introduce who you are, what you do, and then answer two questions for us initially. What gets you most excited about mass timber? What is the single thing that is most exciting for you about mass timber and the story that it has to tell? And then part B of that question is, what's the biggest challenge you see in telling that story? And Mike, if you're ready, you can go first, but I know I prepped Nicole, so she can go first if not. Uh, I am ready, I can go. My name is Mike Bradley uh, with a construction company called Beacon Builders. So right off the bat, I have to say I'm a lot more comfortable on a job site than I am here, uh, <laughs> so bear with me on that. I think my role here is as the guy who put it together. Um, so we built the first CLT building in Spokane, Washington last year. The company's based in Spokane, and we just had an opportunity to build it, so we did. Uh, this year we've got two full crews with a superintendent, project manager, and a crew lead going in different directions, but last year we only had one when this job came up, so I had to actually build the building myself. So I got really good hands-on experience building it, uh, really just me and two um, inexperienced kids built that building in three weeks. So it was great to get hands-on experience actually putting the stuff together uh, to kind of understand how it works. So. Uh, I think that's it for now. Okay, challenge. You, you ducked the challenge. Yes. What do you, what's, I mean, maybe just in terms of doing that project, but if you think more broadly too, what do you see as the biggest challenge in helping people understand the potential of, of mass timber? I think I see a couple challenges with it. I think uh, the construction industry is really resistant to change. I think part of that is that the building user anticipates the built environment to last forever. Like this building here, you know, you expect it to last forever. And, and we know if it's concrete and steel, we know exactly what we're getting. Um, there have been some like epic failures in materials like smart siding, some EFIS, a couple things have happened where a building user invests a lot of money and then 10, 10, 15 years later, something goes wrong. And at that point, in all honesty, the building user will never really get any kind of compensation from the team that built the building. So I think the users are resistant to anything that's new and different. And then I think contractors, it takes a lot of time to develop your machine, your tools, your knowledge base, your uh, experience, your ability to estimate a certain way. And you get really good at it and it starts to kind of run itself. And anytime you do something different, you got to tool up new tools, new experience, new uh, risk factors. So I would see those being two big uh, resistances. Very good. I, for, for being on stage and not on a work site, I think that was excellent. Thank you. And if you, wanna, if you want revenge, I can come and klutz around on your work site anytime you like. That sounds great. You, you can pay back. Actually, okay. you don't have to have any skills to do it. Uh, <laughs> you should talk to my wife before you let me come on your building site, mate. Yeah. Okay, Nicole. Uh, hi, my name is Nicole Miller, and I'm the managing director at Biomimicry 3.8. And we provide biological and ecological intelligence to help companies design uh, new products, processes, buildings, and even cities. So our work mostly in the, in the built environment is largely around using place-based ecological knowledge to help the builders, uh, developers, architects, actually create a building that is fit to place. So for example, in a desert, understanding the keystone species of a desert in terms of how it manages water, how it manages thermal regulation, we can actually glean the information from uh, those species, translate that into concepts that can be integrated into the building design, so you have a, a building that's uh, more fit to place. And the other aspect that we do in the built environment is um, looking at ecosystem services of, um, of healthy habitats that surround the building um, or city or community and use that as a performance benchmark for um, creating net positive buildings, so buildings that are generating ecosystem services on par to um, the forest next door. So that's mostly where our work in the built environment um, is related. To your questions, um, what excites me most about mass timber, really kind of two things. One, I think the design and human health performance perspective of this in terms of what it, what it brings into a building. You have situations where I think people spend 90% of their time indoors. Um, you've got 
70% of uh, the workforce disengaged with what they're doing, spending their time indoors. And then you've got all these incredible statistics that are coming out around the neuroscience, and some of which Bill was talking about this morning, in terms of like what happens when you get people outside. We're innately connected to nature. It's in our DNA, right? And there's this great book that came out um, in 2016 called The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. And what she identified uh, through her research is that if you get people outside within 15 minutes, cortisol levels decrease. So this is our stress um, trigger, right? So within 15 minutes, that decreases. You spend 45 minutes, you actually see improved performance, cognitive performance with people. So this type of information that, that we're able to translate now into the importance of our spaces, so this, like we're spending 90% of our time indoors, but we have no connection to nature. And so these um, statistics that we're starting to learn about health and human performance, I think is huge in terms of what we in the building community can do to improve people's health, happiness, and satisfaction. Um, so I, I think that's, that's a huge one. Second, I think, is the environmental impact um, in terms of what we can do there. Like the most recent IPCC report says that to, for climate change, that we can actually start to reverse climate change, not just combat it, but reverse it if we can draw down carbon. So the fact that buildings can be a carbon sink, not only buildings but the forests that produce them can help create a carbon sink is huge. And to me that's very exciting and that, that we have this possibility in front of us. Challenge. Mm. Um, I think it kind of builds on your point. I think in any industry where you don't have transparency, um, it can be challenging. And I think we've seen this across other industries where if you can get out in front of the, the elephants in the room, so to speak, like you all know the challenges that you're facing, whether it's you know, with the fire codes or with toxicities and environment, like we know they're there, right? And so as an industry, if, you, if, if we can talk about those up front and provide transparency, knowing that they exist, like a, a separate industry, but I, I think a great correlation is um, the apparel industry. Like, so the apparel industry is the second most polluting industry after oil and gas. So Patagonia, a large clothing manufacturer, a lot of you know, they came out and essentially said, here's everything that's wrong with our supply chain. Here's all the toxicities we produce, here's all the water, everything. And they owned it. And they said, we don't have this right, but we know it's a problem and we're gonna work towards that. And that got them huge credibility. And so I think the same can be said for, for this industry as well, and that it's a very exciting time. And I think challenges can be combated with transparency. Fantastic. Thomas. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Thomas Robinson. I'm the founder of Lever Architecture. Um, we're a Portland-based firm. And it's really, I would say, focused on innovation. And I think are maybe a more recent member of the wood community. Uh, really because of the work that we've done over the last couple of years um, on the framework project, um, which everyone's asking me about when it's going to start. Um, and I'll <laughs> transparency. <laughs> and, go, go with transparency on this. To be very transparent, yeah. we are closing the financing on it and we'll be working on starting this summer. So everything takes a little bit longer than you might expect, but we're really moving forward and excited about the project. Um, the other... Uh, piece um, project that we've sort of been known for in Portland is Albina Yard, which is our office uh, just about a mile and a half away, and it was one of the first projects in the United States to use domestically fabricated um, CLT. So that was, so that's really, really been our focus on wood, but I also, um, the, he asked what, I guess what, what I'm most excited about, and I think um, as an architect and a designer, what I'm most excited about is what I'm working on right now. And uh, that happens to be, at least in the context of this conference, the mass plywood uh, pavilion, little mountain that you saw in the center downstairs. And why I'm excited about that is because it's uh, something that came out of a collaborative effort with the manufacturers and, and really trying to think of how you can take the materials that we have 
and those materials can be the raw uh, timber, or it can be the knowledge, or it can be the spirit of innovation, and kind of leveraging that into um, real uh, experiences that people can feel. And that's really our focus, you know, as a firm, and uh, something that kind of gets me up in the morning. Um, I guess in terms of challenges, I think the challenge I see is uh, keeping that collaborative uh, spirit alive as more people come into the market, um, more people start looking at what we're doing. Uh, I think that sometimes introduces a sense of like, hey, I don't know if I wanna share this because these other people are coming in. I think I would encourage everyone to really reach out to people. That idea of transparency is so critical. Uh, and I think will be something that we should try to really work on and carry forward. Great, over to you, Jim. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. Uh, my name's Jim Desmond, and I'm the executive director of the Nature Conservancy in Oregon. And uh, as probably most of you know, the Nature Conservancy is the largest conservation organization in the world. We work in 72 countries, and in our 60-year history, we've protected 120 million acres of critical habitat land around the world. Um, as an organization, we're really bullish on the opportunity that CLT uh, and Mass Timber presents. Um, I would say the thing, that there's two things I'm probably most excited about. The one, as Nicole and others have mentioned, is the environmental footprint, the construction industry, steel and concrete, have a very heavy carbon um, uh, impact, obviously. Uh, or our organization has five global goals, top level goals that we all manage to, and the reduction of carbon and the mitigation of the impacts of climate change are top level priority for us. And the construction industry is a place where today a great deal of carbon is produced and the CLT uh, construction has the potential to be a game changer in our opinion there. Um, and of course, California, as Nicole mentioned, it's already been recognized in the California protocols around carbon pricing that the sequestration of carbon, even inside the buildings after they're bought, besides the, the uh, decrease in um, carbon production off the construction itself by not using steel or concrete. So there's kind of a, a twofer, if you will, that's really, really uh, important. Um, it, it, as an Oregonian, I guess the second thing I'm excited about is um, the potential to have a complete life cycle that's local, from the raw materials to the manufacturing to the finished product to the design, uh, the engineering, the construction, and the enjoyment of the building itself could all take place within the same economic shed, if you will, uh, uh, you know, in o Oregon, uh, we hope we'll be a leader there, but I can't think of another major manufactured good where all of it could be um, produced and, and kept locally. That, that is a really rare opportunity, uh, uh, I, I think, here, that from a job point of view and bridging the urban-rural divide and, you know, a number of societal things that we struggle with um, and, and, and certainly rural economic growth um, there's great potential here, so um, re really excited about that. The, the challenge, um, certainly from our organizational perspective, is whether the industry can be a leader in sustainable uh, forest management um, and really let the sustainability goals of this drive the market towards uh, much more sustainable uh, growth and harvesting of timber. This could either be done right or, or, or not done so well. And, and forest management, as all of you, I think, would concede, has been uh, uneven uh, at best. And here's an opportunity to really get that right and, and um, harvest and uh, grow timber in a way that also provides benefits for fish and wildlife habitat, clean water, clean air, so that there are multiple ben benefits and we create really a virtuous cycle of materials um, uh, as part of this, and you know, I sort of point to your your forest proud. I think there's a way to do this that it really becomes a game changer and a leader around sustainability and uh, forward-thinking uh, timber management that CLT could really drive because of its other societal goals. But I I, I don't think that will happen without a, a lot of push on the demand side, good collaboration and transparency that's been cited here, um, and frankly. We'll have to 
to, to some extent push against some other forces that wouldn't necessarily view that as as much of a goal as, say, organizations like mine. But in my limited dealings with it, I've dealt with Thomas on another project. I've been really impressed with the commitment to sustainability that the early adopter practitioners of this field, at least here in Portland, uh, are exhibiting. So that, that's made me really optimistic that we can face that challenge. Excellent. Great place to, to segue to a kind of set of questions. And at this point, I'm gonna, it's going to be a race. You, know, you press the buzzer, and then you get, to, you get to go first. Or you can just be a buzzer. I'm not sure we have a, have a buzzer. But we had a, we had a phone call the other day to talk about what are the topics we want to talk about. And of course, we got deep into it right away. And there were a whole bunch of different ones. And at some point, Thomas said, you know, what we haven't talked about is no one knows what mass timber and CLT is, right? Which in this room is so hard to imagine. I mean, I think it's hard for us to imagine, especially after three, four days of four different tracks of all the you know, really getting down into the weeds of what CLT is all about. But I think this is a, a really good place to start this discussion. When you, and, and we can take questions on this from, you know, each topic from the audience, but when you, when you start the discussion of mass timber and CLT, and you have that kind of beginner's mind of how you talk to people about this, where, where do you start the conversation? Where do you think the best place to start is if you're selling these projects or you're starting to talk to people about this is, this is a choice, right? They have a series of choices. How do you start the conversation around, around that? Buzzers. Press the buzzer, Tom. Oh, right. Um, you know, I think, I think I was actually going to, when you said you started your conversation today, to the idea of telling the story, mm. uh, that was actually going to think, the thing I was going to talk about, but you, you stole my thunder there. Go there. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I, I think that story is really critical. And, and for me, um, to tell the story, sometimes I, um, we, we kind of, our team coined the term like uh, forest to frame, which is kind of a play on farm to table. And I, I like to, when I talk about CLT sometimes, I like to talk about food. Because um, in a way, we've experienced, at least in Portland, a revolution in terms of how we think about food, how we consume food and that how we think about it has an impact on um, the way food is um, sometimes grown, uh, the way, and that has an impact on the economies that it's grown in. I think there's a lot of parallels between mm -hmm. that and CLT. I think there's also parallels between what we see as very uh, um, common today, um, buying organic vegetables and fruit in, in uh, you know, a large supermarket which did not exist, you know, maybe 15 years ago. You're just like, I'd have to go to a health food store, right? And that little tiny store on the corner. Uh, and now you can do that anywhere. And, and that has had a major impact on the way agriculture, you know, grows food, how it produces it. So I, what I like about um, that analogy is that you could sort of talk about it with CLT in that for me, um, when you have a great meal, a lot of the times the ingredients are really fresh, they're local, and that leads to a great experience. I, I see analogies when you, when you do it right um, with CLT, you have a great experience, but that experience also has some positive side, of, uh, side effects, mm -hmm. as long as it's coming from a um, sustainably managed forest, and then that ripples down the supply chain. And I, I think that that for me is a way I can explain it to my parents or friends. Uh, and, and, you know, without getting into the sort of technical, you know, like, hey, this is a more stable product and all these other things that probably only really architects and engineers care about. <laughs> right. So CLT is the kale salad of the forest products industry. That's, that's where we're going with that one. I like that. I like my kale like salads. The, kind of. uh, yeah, I won't, I won't say it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> We, and certainly at my organization where we have a lot of scientists, we are really good at cranking out really geeky data about carbon and we can, we can go deep in a hurry with a lot of factual stuff that's really compelling to us, but I would come at it from a, a way more humanistic uh, point of view. I, this will sound really oversimplified and s stupid maybe, but I think people just like wood. People like wood building. Yeah. They like, to me, concrete and steel are cold and impersonal, and I never feel good around, they don't make me feel good. You've never heard anybody talk about their new house and, and tell you that it had 
great carpeting. They're going to talk about the great hardwood floors that they didn't know were there, and then the carpeting got torn up, and they're so excited because their new house has these cool hardwood floors that they didn't even know about. That's what we as humans relate to. I, I think there is a uh, just an, an innate human appeal that Wood holds that we shouldn't lose sight of. Um, and, you know, people go for a walk in the woods to feel better. It makes us feel better, whether it's in our, our home or our neighborhood park, in a way that um, I don't think anybody ever got a warm and fuzzy feeling from a sand and gravel operation. I, I've not, in my experience, I've not, and I, I'm not trying to, there's probably people in that industry in the room, I'm sorry, I was trying to be a little, try to bring a little levity to it since we're keeping you from the brew pub at this point. But I, I do think there's a, just uh, a, a, an innate love of wood products that, that we all feel. Yeah, the strange irony is you're in Portland, so there probably are concrete huggers in Portland, because <laughs> if they're anywhere, they're going to be in this town somewhere. Nicole, where, where do you start when you're trying to, trying to pull people on this? When I'm trying to. When you're try, if, you're try, if you were trying to start telling this story to folks, and from the perspective of 3.8 billion years of, yeah. uh, of knowledge, where, where do you think is the best starting point for that conversation? You know, I, th I think it's really similar to kind of what's been said in terms of just talking to what people find most important, right? You know, so if it's this fact that people, you know, it's inherently in our DNA to be attracted to these types of products and therefore it's a better design product from an aesthetic as far as uh, performance and everything else. So. I guess what I always try to do is kind of meet people where they're at and mm -hmm. celebrate what they're already doing. So I think in terms of like building that's, that's using small components of it, you know, that, that's great. And then let's celebrate that and move it to the, to the next level. Um, I think there's so many great qualities about CLT and mass timber and I mean, all the things that we've already talked about, I think give such a springboard for a conversation for why it's important. Um, and then in terms of defining what it is, to your point earlier, right, it's um, how do we get everyone on the same page in terms of what we are talking about? It's a pretty big industry. Everyone has different components that they touch within it. Um, so I think it's just, one, aligning with people with what you're talking about. Um, celebrating where they're at and helping them identify how it can meet their needs. Gotcha. <laughs> um, I can say, like on a personal level, I really buy into everything uh, that you that you guys are saying um, personally. But I, I can also say that somebody's got to be the dollars and cents at the end of the day. It's especially um, for developers and people that think some of that's a bunch of hippie nonsense. Mm -hmm. I personally really buy into it, but I think that um, my role in the jobs that I've been involved with so far has been the dollars and cents, rubber meets the road. How do these details actually work and how much does it really cost and how does that compare? And I've found that I can make the argument really well from a pure dollars and cents standpoint. If we put CLT in and just buried it and nobody even knew we'd used it, it still makes sense from dollars and cents in a lot of cases. Not in every case. And people get really kind of puritanical about it, and, and I can kind of back off and say, like, these elements really make sense to be CLT. These elements really make sense to be prefabricated stick frame walls. This might make sense to be a steel beam. Um, so I think there's a really good dollars and cents argument to be made if you're selective about where you apply it. OK, hang on to the microphone for a sec, Mike. Because I agree with you on hippie nonsense, so we need to avoid going too far down the hippie nonsense. I don't have the hair for hippie nonsense, as I've already talked about today, but, but you do tell great stories, so I actually just want to invite you, because I, I want to get at least one good story out of everybody as we go through this, and uh, I had dinner with Russ Fargan last night, he's like, hey, ask him about the gym and the heating story, okay? So uh, this is not, so I'm going to get you off your Excel spreadsheet just for one second. Yes, and, <laughs> that's and, a good point. And tell us the story, because I think this is a great example of, of how to get people to understand something that's very complex. Uh, with a great simple story. So can you tell, tell us that story? Yes. Yes, I will. Thank you, Russ. <laughs> um, <laughs> Russ okay. dumped you in it. It wasn't me. So we, we built this building in August in Spokane, where it's like, you know, 110 degrees, really hot. Uh, the building's heated with two big unit heat. It's almost like the same size and shape of this room here. And it's just got two big, massive unit heaters in each end to heat the building. And they're gas-fired. 
So we took them through their startup, got them all going, got everything going, but it was 110 degrees outside, so we closed the valves and locked them off and left. And then in December, my customer calls me and he's like, why haven't we gotten a gas bill yet? And I couldn't figure it out. And so, so Spokane in, in, in August is 110, and in December it might be like negative five. So I went down there and realized I'd forgotten to unlock his unit heaters. <laughs> and he hadn't turned on the heat yet, and it was getting down into the single digits, and it was you know, cool in the room, like 65, but it wasn't cold. So that's pretty, pretty compelling. Right. I don't know the exact that's... data on the usage, but... <laughs> we don't need the data, we just need this great story, right? I mean, you know, now you're going to break out the bar chart and the, you know, 25-page formula for what happened, but the fact that you didn't have to have it cooled in the summer or heated in the winter is a darn good way of getting past past the spreadsheet, I think, on, on that one. It's a really excellent story. And a good segue to, I want to sort of move us to performance, right? If we talk about CLT and mass timber and how it performs on some of these different characteristics, and we can talk, you know, we can hit a bunch of different ones, but when we talk about carbon, and I'd love to, I'd love to hit carbon, because I think for most of us in the room, uh, there may be many people in the room that fully get the carbon story. I'd love to meet with you afterwards, and you can explain it to me if you do. But when we talk about carbon, how do we tell that story? What's the, and, and Nicole, I might come back to you on that one, because I know you have, have a lot of experience doing that. But what's the best way to, uh, A, tell that story, and B, what do we still need to learn? You know, I think one thing we don't want to do on this panel is in this, in this safe room, talking about mass timber and CLT, is say we have all the answers, right? But what, what do we need to learn about carbon that we don't yet know? Uh, and so what's on the shopping list for, for learning about carbon? And how should we go about telling that story in a way that's authentic and transparent and, and true to what's actually happening. No pressure. That's not a big question to have okay. to answer. OK. <laughs> um, so it, there is a lot to talk about with carbon in buildings. And, sure. um, and so I can speak to what I know and the work that, that we've done. Um, and I'll also um, take a slight tangent and talk about some of the other work that we do in terms of design is looking at things like bone algorithm and how we can use algorithms to actually maintain st structural integrity of building and using less materials, right? So when we talk about like embodied carbon in a building, that's 50% of the materials, but 50% of that structure isn't being used, right? So. Um, it was with embodied carbon. So there's like that whole conversation. Okay, pause for one second. Yeah. Raise your hand if you know what embodied carbon means. See? Yeah, it's pretty good. They, they all have good. a good Okay, you, yeah. you may proceed. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, there's, so there's that component of it. I think with the work that we've done most recently with this work, um, Factories of Forest, is that's the conversation that excites our clients the most. Uh, we have clients like, for example, Interface Floor, which their whole sustainability strategy, uh, their new sustainability strategy, they, they met their 2020 goals, so now they're designing their, their next set of goals, um, which is all around climate take back and building on kind of what I said earlier, that carbon is the one way in which scientists have agreed we can reverse climate change. So how can their buildings start to meet these goals? And by integrating these kind of metrics that I talked about earlier, the ecosystem service performance metrics around carbon, understanding how the forest next door, the amount of carbon that's being sequestered, using that as a building performance benchmark and using materials like CLT to meet that benchmark is one where we're getting a lot of interest. It's, it's, it's very kind of topic du jour for us um, in terms of the, the builders and architects that we work with is how can we meet those carbon performance goals and with CLT being the primary um, input that, that can support that. So that's what's really, I think, exciting about this conversation of, of carbon. Um, does that? I thought that was pretty good. Okay. Yeah, good, good start. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep yeah. passing this back and forth like a, like a pendulum. Thomas, if you, when people ask about carbon for the, for the framework building specifically, how, do you do that analysis? Have do you yeah. run that? And how do you, how do you? I mean, I, I also want to just circle it. back to the, uh, 
um, the idea of performance economically yeah. that Mike dressed on. Because, you know, I, I definitely, um, my motivation to be involved with this was initially about um, just wanting to create these amazing spaces shaped by this material. Um, but the only way that's going to happen is if I can do it economically and actually figure out the, how do we use the supply chain we have to create buildings. So our office, um, which I, we designed and I pretty much know every detail by heart in that building. I could, could you know, even though we didn't, I didn't physically build it, uh, you know, was a market rate project. And that's probably, you know, it was, you know, whatever, I'll say it was $200 a square foot, um, you know, and it's fully leased before we finished it. I unfortunately don't own it. <laughs> but I actually didn't even um, start the project with the idea of leasing it. But it, at the end, I said, hey, you know, we designed this thing. We know every square inch of it. We should actually practice on fitting out the top floor. And so I think that idea of performance, you know, because I do talk about a lot of other things, um, you know, that are more sort of, uh, you know, aspirational. You can't have those experiences if you can't actually make the building, right? So you got to go, the way we see it is you have to start with the aspirational idea and at the same time hold the end product and all the financing and all those details to make that happen. Um, but so I want to talk about that as a performance-based issue. There's the economic performance of this product. I'm hoping that we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. That's kind of what I'd like to create. On terms of the carbon, we had a very intensive carbon, uh, you know, component to framework, uh, and it's still ongoing. Um, that included actually when we actually initially started to find our partners for the supply of the wood, we actually had each of them fill out a kind of carbon metric talking about not just, uh, you know, the actual where the wood's coming from, but actually, you know, how far is it away from the site. Uh, so that was all kind of calced into the bids. So we could look kind of um, apples to apples, carbon, the embodied carbon of each sort of manufacturer we're looking at. We are, um, you know, involved with a full life cycle analysis to compare the carbon um, in our building to maybe a typical uh, steel and a typical concrete building. I mean, the reality though is we can't complete that until we actually build the building because so many of the, um, you know, products, you need to know what it is that uh, you've done. And I, I do hope that there will be sort of more voluntary reporting of, you know, where things are coming from because you need to build up that sort of those layers of technology. So that's ongoing. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we all have to kind of dive in and actually just figure this out. And I think the way we're going to figure it out is to start actually doing more of these buildings and being transparent about, you know, what went into them. Uh, the only other point I would make, and again, kind of an obvious one, but the uh, particular, this is an international conference. If you look at the world population that we know is coming, um, then there's going to be a great deal of additional construction to house all these uh, people and their jobs. And the construction industry now is responsible for a significant portion of carbon emissions. I, th I thought I'd written a note on that. Does 40% sound right? I'm looking at Nicole and Thomas. I, I, that number sticks in my head, but I'm, I'm not yeah. veri verifying it. But it's, it's, it's significant. And so there's going to be a great deal more construction. It's already a big carbon emitter. The opportunities to reverse that impact are very few, obviously. And here is a really, really significant one. I mean, it, construction and operations. Construction and operations. And OK, that would make, thank you. I knew I'd say you had experts up here. Um, that, that's extremely significant. There's an opportunity here that we can't uh, let slip through our fingers. And, the, and again, go back to my opening comments about the importance of getting it right for the full life cycle. And Thomas and I have both mentioned the sustainable harvest of the wood. Um, it, 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 there's a significant environmental uh, opportunity here um, in, a, in a 
place where it's badly needed and there's not really anywhere else to go for it. That's an excellent point. And you, you start, in this conversation, what fascinates me is we start to, you can, you can be very specific. This is, this is what the building does, this is what CLT does, this is what a piece of mass timber does. But you can also kind of pan all the way out to reimagining cities. And you're start, when you say, you know, we think about this from an international perspective. If you think about, which I think in this sector, we t again, we tend to end up defending against one issue or another or one group or another. Um, instead of perhaps saying, we're actually dealing with some really big societal challenges as a sector, and we're starting to reimagine cities. And I, when I think about Portland and the conversation, I live in Portland and the conversation going on here, it's done, this, this city has been reimagined maybe a number of times, but you can tell this is a key part of that conversation right now. If you look at the Broadway corridor or what's gonna go on there, right? So that, that all comes open to, to a broader discussion. But if you think about the role of mass timber in reimagining cities, which is a pretty big question to dig into, um, Thomas, I know we've, we've talked briefly about that. What, what are your thoughts on, on how to tell that part of the, the tale? And I think that you can fold some things into that. We talk about rural-urban divide. We talk about rural employment and mass timber, which seems to have tremendous potential, even if we're not there yet. But talk to me a bit about reimagining a city through this lens. I mean, I think to be you know, totally transparent, I've, so I've been in Portland, I guess, 13 years. I worked now as an architect since, uh, you know, it's a little more than that, since 2003, and it's only in the last three years have I really connected with, uh, you know, the forest uh, community, you know, in a personal way. You know, here we are in a state uh, that produces, I think, the largest amount of, you know, timber, structural timber in the country, um, or maybe it's not, but it's very close. Uh, and there's this amazing ingredient, I say, material, whatever you want to call it, and it's grown um, in its native habitat in southern Oregon. It's one of the best places in the world to grow Doug fir. Um, we also have really good wine here, too, but... Uh, um, don't remind them about... <laughs> yeah. but Not I, yet we don't. Yeah, in um, but I, in I, a little while so we do. What am I, I'm getting the point that, for me, it's been incredibly satisfying to say, hey, you know, I can actually work with a material that's grown in the region and the people, and, and get to know the people that are actually managing these forests, actually fabricating the material, and you know that all happens in this region and it has an impact. And I know the impact may be, um, in terms of numbers, relatively small in you know the rural part of Oregon where the, the product is manufactured, but it, in that community, it's very large. And I think that's really kind of exciting to be connected to that in some way. And, you know, even to like, um, when I went down there and talked to some people, you know, everyone's like, you know, we're really proud to be doing a building in Portland. You know, they were pretty excited about it. And I, you know, and I'm really proud that the building that we work in every day in Portland, you know, is from Oregon and from the forests that are here. So that kind of connection is really valuable. Uh, and I think is something that, um, you know, is more personal and more direct. Um, and, uh, you know, I, that's why, you know, now I'm doing work with uh, Frayers. And, you know, I love going down to Lyons, Oregon. It's like, God, get out of Portland. I'm so excited, <laughs> you know, actually into the landscape and forests. And I feel uh, that um, more designers and architects should be, you know, doing that. Not because it's, you know, not for any you know, it's just because it's great to do, you know, and I think that's something that, you know, I get excited about. Jim, you're good. Uh, this will do a, a twofer answer, because you asked for personal stories as well as this question. So uh, the Nature Conservancy owns its office building here in Portland. About half of our state, or half of our staff work here in Portland, and the other half are in various places around the rest of the state, but we have about 45 people housed here in a 15,000 square foot building that we own that's in a really great neighborhood about a mile from here, actually, if those of you from Oregon at 14th and Belmont, and it, it was just not a good building. Uh, it, was, it was a parole office for the county before we, before we got it, uh, and um, 
the windows leaked. It's a 15,000 square foot building with seven HVAC systems. Don't ask me how. So here the Nature Conservancy of all entities is in the most unsustainable, <laughs> least green, and even worse than that from a business perspective, from my perspective, everyone was in a private office because it was parole offices. And there were these long, dark hallways, and I, when, I took, when I started the job three years ago, I had all these scientists, and everybody's in their office with the door closed and nobody talked to anybody. And I realized this is just all wrong. So we looked at redoing the building. I was introduced to my friend Thomas here. Uh, who is leading the design, uh, the redesign of our building. And I was really excited. I thought, you know, I figured the building was so crappy, we'd have to build a new one, and then we could build a CLT building. I thought, how cool would that be if the Nature Conservancy, I thought we could beat framework to it, and we'd have the first, uh, one of the first CLT buildings in the state, and then the people who do numbers for a living, like Mike, came and looked at our building and said, you know what? This structure is really sound. And of course, the most sustainable thing to do would be to work with the existing structure, which was wood frame. Uh, and so we're redoing the inside, and it's a significant redo of the building to achieve the business goals. And we're using all Oregon uh, materials, but we're building a small addition to the building. There'll be a multi purpose room that we're going to let other conservation organizations anywhere around the state use for free for meetings. So it'll put about 30 people around a table for like a board meeting or 70 people in rows of chairs for an event like this for science lectures and that kind of thing. Or if you took everything, all the chairs out, a reception for about 100, which is a good space for us. We will be using CLT in that portion of the building. Um, it'll be all Oregon materials, and I think for a conservation organization to be able to bring people to a modern, sustainable, low energy, uh, we're not going to be quite net zero, but we're getting way down there, aren't we, Thomas? You're getting us way down, right? Okay, all right. He keeps promising me. Um, we can spend more money. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's a different kind of net zero. Yeah. I think, that tells a, I think that tells a great story, and the fact that some of what goes into this building will create, will have created jobs in the rural areas where a lot of our conservation work goes on and where sometimes conservation is not as, as embraced um, uh, just culturally. So, you know, sometimes it's difficult for, for just anybody called the Nature Conservancy to go into certain places in the state and talk about our work. This b building really allows us to walk all of that talk. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm really, so just as, um, you know, we talk about the rebuilding of Portland. We made a, a decision to reinvest in our neighborhood. The city would have wanted a five or six story, 75,000 square foot building there, and we opted to stay with basically our same footprint and, 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 and use wood products. So um, I, I think that tells a great story for us as an organization. For sure. Thanks, sir. Nicole, reimagining cities. You guys, something tells me you guys have done some thinking on on that probably. <laughs> we have done some thinking in this space um, and I think what's really exciting is the amount of interest that we've seen from from cities from different um, both in the US and uh, internationally of um, economic development organizations of municipalities leaders within those communities who really want to push the envelope of what a climate smart city means and what that looks like. And so we've been engaged in, a, in conversations around how we can use metrics um, and numbers to really kind of drive that conversation for performance um, and really kind of meeting to that goal that I talked about earlier this morning in that you know, having cities be functionally indistinguishable from the forest next door and that being the true marker for sustainability. And this is something that cities are really excited about when they think about resiliency, when they think about the long-term um, implications to the community and stakeholders from a health perspective. Uh, primarily the resiliency is where we're seeing this. Um, and so what does it look like to build a resilient city? What does it look like to, um, have cities that perform at this level. So we've been having um, conversations. We don't have a pilot. We, we have pilots um, on, a, on a building level and on a campus level, um, but we have yet to start a pilot on a city level, but we've had um, quite a few conversations, which I think is where it has to start, right? The, the interest is there. 
Um, it triggers, I think, a, a, a lot of excitement. Um, it, something that's really great about biomimicry and I think nature in general is no one, no one like hates nature, right? Like no one's like, that's a really <laughs> shitty idea. Do you want to do it? <laughs> Raise your hand if you hate nature. Let's just get it. Like, could be so here. it's this, what, what we found is that we can really kind of democratize a conversation around building, around design, around planning, if we can get, bring it back to this aspirational goal. Now, I think you're absolutely right in that you have to tie the aspirational goal to an economic performance that, that meets uh, the criteria that's, that, um, that they're being kind of held to. So I agree 100%. It can't all be, you know, uh, aspiration. So I think in terms of the city's conversation, what excites me and what, what we're seeing is that we have a handful of cities that want to engage in this conversation and want to push the envelope of what is what does a climate smart city look like? Very cool. Mike, anything to add on that one? Uh, yeah. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to be such a downer on the numbers. And, <laughs> <laughs> and I think. It happen without it. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. I think I think we have good news coming, or uh, or I think we have news that's good for CLT coming. Like the steel tariffs right off the bat are, are going to be good for CLT. I think. Someone shut the door, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah you know, carbon tax proposed, um, uh, anything, um, any one of those factors can swing very quickly in our favor. Like you were saying, the fact that it's all right here, it's right next door, it, the whole cycle is right in here, it helps. Um, uh, you know, global instability is good for something that close. Uh, so I think that helps it. Um, I, sorry, I just, it's just the fact. Facts of it for us. We can look at it as a hedge against global instability, I guess. Or just go with it. I don't know. <laughs> um, you asked about the future of cities. And I think that we, our company is looking at two pretty good ideas. And one is in Spokane, we have a really old downtown built of unreinforced masonry buildings. And a lot of people want to bring them higher. So, so there's a lot of studies done in Spokane about how to make that a port in place concrete structure, and it's too heavy. So we've actually looked at two different buildings downtown Spokane where we would take one or two of the brick floors off and go up with five CLT floors. So I get really excited about the idea of a regular grid. Like if we can figure out the spans, if it's composite, whatever it is, is it 12 feet, is it 20 feet? I'd love to see 20 feet in the commercial buildings. And then just do glue lamp post and beam CLT floors, and we could really try to standardize that building everywhere we go. We could build it really fast. And, and then once it's economical, then it works for everything else. And then, sorry, one more thing. Um, the city of Spokane is really struggling with urban infill. Spokane is a really flat city. It's very, we don't have a lot of high rises or anything like that. So they're trying to subdivide, subdivide the minimum lot requirements. So if you have a house on a lot that's big enough to put another house on, uh, they've got like 60 of these properties, and they've gone to all of the regular home builders like, a, like AHO and a Viking and some of these national guys that don't want to touch it because it's too weird and it's too outside their wheelhouse, but we could do it. We could design like three or four models of a CLT home, and we could put 60 of them in place in one summer. Gotcha. Any questions? Let's take a, a slight pause and check questions from the audience. And if I can hear you, I can repeat the question. If not, I'll... Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. You're good. I've been an expert sports fan for a while. I've been working 20 years on uh, making the baseball come to Portland. Tom was nice enough to meet with me when we started the framework uh, project with the uh, block of my office. Tom, come in on what a project like that can do. I've been in this uh, for three days. I'm not an expert, but I've been very impressed. And I really think that a baseball stadium, a mass school baseball stadium, 150 years ago, we did it that way. I guess you just talk about a story. <laughs> um, but I think, I think, you know, to be real, they are building, you know, I was in, I gave a lecture in Norway, and they're building a large timber um, soccer stadium, you know, and it's, it's, it's done, being done by Zaha Hadid, if you're, you know, if you know, um, her office, unfortunately, she's no longer with us. But I think, you know, and, and people are incredibly excited about it. And it's something uh, that, like I said, connects uh, the region to um, the city, to sports, 
um, on so many levels and at a very high volume <laughs> compared to you know the smaller projects that we're talking about today. So um, you know, I, everyone I talk to about it gets incredibly excited about the idea, and I think that you know I think I think that obviously it has legs because of that. And I, I and I the question is is like it's sort of combining things that people feel kind of good about, you know, and I think, um, I think people want to feel proud and good about what they're doing. And so I feel that's, that's why we're excited. That's the most awesome idea I've ever heard. <laughs> I, I've lived, I just want to say, I've lived here 25 years. I grew up in Detroit. I'm a huge baseball fan. And people always ask me, like, what's the you know, what one thing don't you like about living in Portland? Because I'm always raving about Portland. I'm like, oh, it's really a drag. There's no baseball. And a mass timber produced, sustainably harvested, environmental showcase baseball stadium for a guy that loves baseball works for the Nature Conservancy. I'm like about to jump out my seat here. <laughs> as long as you that's, don't play that's, cricket. That's why we work together. I'm, I'm exactly. it. <laughs> yeah. other, other questions from the audience? Unless anyone wants to talk more about baseball. How excited they are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what, what could slow us down, derail what we're trying to do and sp with mass timber, with the specifics of some code, some code thrown in? Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. I think the code's pretty good from 2015. They allowed a lot more in 2015. I think there's still some height limits, like uh, six stories probably for type four, if I remember right. But in my wheelhouse, in my world, we don't really go above six stories anyway. I think we've got the fireproof connections figured out. I think we've got the floor to floor fire barriers figured out. I think we've, we've got it figured out where it'll go through without any kind of proscriptive review. We just sailed through the city of Spokane, and they're pretty conservative. And now we've got one going in Cheney, which is even more conservative. And it's um, been good conversations, nothing outside the code. But that's only six stories. After that, it gets a little bit harder. Uh, yeah, please. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, what's interesting about the code, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the code and then just bigger things, is, you know, there are, buildings built with mass timber or timber, we call it car decking in Portland today that you can't build now, but they were from like the 30s and 40s, you know? So we actually have these, some of, a lot of this type four construction, you know, is, is really an old part of the code. Um, and I think that, I think what needs to happen is, is, and what I think, you know, we're involved sort of tangentially talking with those folks um, who are on the committee is, you know, updating, first just updating the code to kind of reflect the technolog technological developments that we have today. So we aren't deciding to not do type four because we have some concealed spaces in our buildings, <laughs> you know. There's just like all these little things in the code that need to be fixed. So I think that's just one level of just, and I think that's gonna happen in the next um, round um, that's just coming up here, the voting. And then it's like getting to the levels of uh, something like framework, which I haven't really talked about a lot, but is, is, not, is a building that's not in the code and is using a performance-based design criteria to actually be approved. And it is approved by the state. And, and also when you do that, you have, uh, you know, um, talk, talk about barriers to actually doing this. We have, you know, we went through almost two years of testing you know, we had an, an international peer review. Um, you know, we did, you know, I don't know, over 30 full-scale tests plus smoke modeling of the, and fire modeling of the entire building, um, full-scale seismic tests of, full-scale fire tests of components. I mean, it's, you know, it's, there's not, this isn't a building that I can think of that's been tested and looked at more closely in terms of its sort of design concepts you know, in, in the U.S. And I think that's the right thing to do. Um, but then you have to say, okay, this is done. We understand how it's performing, and then you could potentially codify that. But, you know, the innovation is going to come first, and there's going to be these buildings out there. 
And there's going to have to be a couple of them that people are going to look at and say, yeah, that looks good. Now we can actually open it up a bit. And that's going to take a bit of time. So I think uh, it's amazing to me how quickly things have progressed already. But you know, I, you know, when I started in architecture doing large projects, one project would take seven years. You know, a large like institutional museum project from start to finish. So things are moving quickly, and I think they'll continue to move. Yep. What, what other ways might we get derailed? And I think that transparency word came up a lot in the introduction. It'd be good to, good to dig into that a bit more in this room. So how do we deal with transparency? I've heard a rumor that there was a failure of some kind in the past week, right? And it's going to be really interesting to see how this group responds to that. But let's talk about transparency and, and the other elements in terms of where we might fail. There you go, Mike. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so I'm not sure what kind of transparency uh, you mean, uh, but as far as the numbers go, almost all of our work is uh, design build or GCCM, so our books are always open to everybody, and I'll estimate it a couple different ways, and I'll show the, everybody exactly how I put it together, and they can question any one of my uh, financial numbers. Um, but I don't know what other, what other kinds of transparency. Yeah, well, I, I've been talking to people about this in the last couple of days in here and giving examples. So there's a great book called Black Box Thinking, and it compares two cultures. Anyone read Black Box Thinking? This would be interesting if a couple of people read that. No one. OK. One person. Good book. And it looks at the culture of the FAA and what happens when there's an accident in the aerospace realm versus uh, the medical realm, hmm. right? And that there's such different cultures. So you know, somebody dies, they try and bury the body. It wasn't the surgeon's fault. Uh, you know, anything they can do to avoid litigation. FAA, a plane crashes, and you get this entire study of why it crashed, what happened, and then everybody tries to learn from that. So they've created a very deliberate culture to learn from what happens in the aerospace realm, whereas in the medical culture, everything works against that learning. So to me, part of the transparency is you're in the early stages of this kind of gold rush of mass timber. Are we going to learn together and have that kind of transparency, or are we going to go the other direction. And I know this is a difficult conversation to have, but I think it's a really interesting thing to dig in from, from a communications perspective. That is it's not difficult. all on you, Mike. You can pass the mic right. at any, any time. Um, I can tell you how I would feel if that panel failed on one of my jobs. I would probably sweep it under the rug. <laughs> or, or at least there would be a, a really Are you sure you want to think a bit more before you say, yeah, 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 yeah okay. <laughs> so I think, I think, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you exactly how much it costs to clean up. <laughs> I, think, um, I think that'll be hard, but I think that's going to be something we're working uphill against, like going back to EFIS again and uh, any of these other huge failures on a big scale. I think that one will set us back. Uh, and I only heard about it this morning, so I'm still thinking it through. But anyway, I think you're right. If, if this happens to any of us, then we, we should probably stick together and try to, try to get, be really transparent about it. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Good company. That was a good turnaround, I think, from the, yeah. Uh, slightly different um, in terms of the, the comment around transparency. One of the things that we've always done with our research and our work is make it available. All of our frameworks and everything are creative commons so that people can use them. So I think the work that we're doing right now with Factories of Forest, um, we're talking about it regularly with each pilot we have. We, we publish um, and we talk about what worked, what didn't work, the challenges. Like the very first project we did was so, it took our research team, I think, twice the time that we had budgeted to come up with the ecological dynamics of the site. Since then, we've now developed software that allows us to do it in a third of that time. So, and we're very open about that. This is the software platform, this is how you use it. So for us, from a transparency standpoint, like we think that this work is so important that we're not keeping it proprietary. We're very open in sharing what the metrics are, how we got them, and what makes it exciting is that every builder, every developer can use those in a different way. Um, and I think that's where the innovation comes in. Um, but from, from my work in the, in the space that we're in, we're really using Creative Commons as a way to get the, the work that we're doing out there. Do you want to touch that one, Thomas? Um, I, I like the example that you used about Patagonia. 
I thought that was interesting, that sometimes these things happen and there's an opportunity for leadership, you know, and I think, uh, I think that's, you know, I think an interesting example, you know, because we are at the early stages. Um, and I said earlier about the, you know, as things get bigger, preserving a bit of the community. We, you know, we learned on our project, um, which was a pretty risky project because it was one of the first to use um, uh, domestic CLT structurally. But we also, we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to, you know, some Canadian fabricators and manufacturers. We just asked lots of questions like, what would you, you know, what would you do? What, what would you do differently? And, you know, one of the things we learned is you got to powder coat or, or galvanize all the steel connectors. We had custom steel connectors. We didn't know, do you know? But that made uh, the difference between a really beautiful building um, and one that um, would be streaked with, like, staining from the oxide mm. from the steel. But that's just, like, it's those little nuggets of information, and I think that's just a very concrete one. But there's also... Uh, you know, more technical ones. So I think, you know, I think just kind of keeping that transparency about what's happening so we can all learn and make sure that, you know, anything, those things don't happen again and we can have, you know, and I think that's, that's key. Yep. Other questions from the audience? Yep. I don't know the answer to that question. I just know it's come up this week, right? Does anyone want to? Oregon State. What was the failure? What was the panel failure that we're talking about? Floor fell. A panel. Panel fell. Oregon State. So we we don't know that much yet, right? But I just think it's a it's a really interesting question in terms of how this group, this culture, is going to address failures as of when they happen and learn from them. Um, we had a gentleman just here, yep. We have a great forum. I'm just looking at your report about... Good. Keep looking. Subliminal message. And Will, Join. I'd like to address this question to you. I'm yeah. an architect and formerly a biologist. And, I, and we're, our firm is an architecture engineering firm and we're designing with mass timber. We just finished up a net zero one. Uh, very proud of it. But when I talk to my uh, biology friends and environmental friends, the, the big problem they have with getting behind the forest industry as a whole is because it's not a whole. It's sustainable forestry and clear cutting or not so sustainable forestry. And the argument they make as biologists is if you clear cut, you have 60% of the carbon Uh, one brand, one message that's about us as being a group of people, a, a group of companies and organizations that really are behind the forest and our connection to human beings and the planet. Can we do it? Because there seems to be different points. Right. And you've talked to everyone. What do you think? Uh, I might have a slide that helps. Okay. So, someone, someone hold on to this. No. no. Great stuff. <laughs> Checks in the mail. Um, free membership for you, but no one else here today. Um, no, it's a great question, and I think it, but it is, by the way, when I talked about, I, I was sort of joking, I can't remember if that was this morning or this afternoon, that every client I talk to says, you know, we're the most split up and, and our issue's more complicated, you'll never simplify us. Oh, and by the way, you know, I've, I've done branding for foundations that fund such diverse topics. And you come in and do a brand strategy for the foundation. So the Packard Foundation, for example, funds reproductive rights, health, conservation, uh, film restoration, and something. And they're like, come on, you can't do this. There's no one way. You, know, you can't bring us together under one brand. And I, frankly, I think that is always an excuse. There is always something that is common that needs to be discovered. And, it's, and you have to just keep digging till you get down to it. Now, in the forest sector, writ large, there are, to me, there's a core set of values and beliefs that cut across everything and all the questions you just asked, right? And I showed these this morning, but I think it's, it's great to go back to them. First of all, touch every part of your life, okay? 
forests can solve big societal challenges, and we need to, I think we need to elevate our narrative up to that level. Not is it green, is it not? Not is the spreadsheet on carbon this or, this or that? Because there, as you said, there's complications to every one of these as you dig into it. Um, but I think for us sol solving big societal challenges is, is the key place to start that conversation. Solutions are rooted in forest management is perhaps one of the most important ways of getting at the question you just raised. Is clear cutting good, bad? Hey, that question is going to be resolved over time and clear cutting may change as a practice over time. I don't think it's Forest Proud's job to say good, bad. It's to create the space to have that conversation. And the space for that conversation gets created, I think, in the public eye. Once people understand that, we are managing all our forests. We manage them in different ways. Saying, it, saying that a forest is permanently protected and will only be entered once every 10 years by a scientist, that's forest management, right? A national park is forest management. A clear cut is forest management. These are just choices in how we manage the forest that we have. And if you can get people to understand that we're making those choices, I think you then have permission to dig into some of the issues you're raising. Um, Doing that requires a lot of people trusted to do their part. Um, and our job is to make choices that keep forests as forests. Now, I think the biggest, and I went through this myself coming into this job, the biggest, there's two huge disconnects. One is the disconnect between here's a forest, and guess what? You're writing a letter to us complaining about a clear cut with a wooden pencil on a piece of paper sitting at a wooden desk in a wooden house. Okay, something's wrong with that. There's a disconnect there between how we use forest products and benefit from them every day and benefit from forests and their ecosystem services. We're not making that connection. But I think the other connection we just don't make, or beyond this room, everyone in this room makes this connection all the time every day, is that if you don't have thriving markets for forests, they're going away, right? And they're gonna get turned into something else. So if we can make, that's, that's a set of arguments to try and answer your question. But my belief is, from talking to our membership, which does cross the whole way across the, this piece, is, and this is what we spent last year really on more than maybe anything else, was what is the lens that works for everybody? And I think the lens that, work, the lens that works for everybody is, is this, right? Forests touch every part of your life. They can solve big societal challenges. The solutions are rooted in management. That's gonna take a lot of people trusted to do their part. And our job is to make choices that keep forests as forests. The word, you know, if I have to do give you the one word answer, it's trust. And how do we build that trust? Why are we talking about transparency? Without transparency, you don't build trust. Um, and I always think it's the, one of the worst discoveries I ever made in terms of reading research was that trust is not a one-time deal, right? If you look at the research on trust, you don't earn trust once and then, you know, for the rest of your marriage. No, I mean, in general. Right? You don't earn trust on one, one time, and once you've earned trust, hey, great, you've ticked that box. Right? If you look at the research on trust, it is an ongoing day-to-day -day thing. We're never going to make everybody trust the entire forest sector. That's not the goal of what we're trying to do here. But that workable middle and getting everybody to understand what we do, uh, I think that that is available to us. And I think the other thing I hear often in the conversations I've had with um, our members is, you know, what I hear underneath the comments is, can you just make those voices go away, right? Can you make the people that were outside protesting, could you just make them go away? You know, that's, it's, it's almost like that's the win. I think there's this underlying misconception that the win is you make those voices go away. Without those voices at the far end of the spectrum, if you want to put it, sort of put it on a spectrum, we don't, we don't have what we need. You need the extreme voices with their misconceptions and their misinformation to push the discussion into the right way. So I don't think I don't think the job of Forest Proud or the job of this sector is to somehow get them all to believe you know our set of the facts. It's to keep moving the conversation in the direction that we that we want it to go. And if we can tell the whole story effectively, I think I think we can get there. So that's a long answer to a to a good question. I don't know if it answered your question well, but th thanks for asking it. Yep. Other questions from folks in the audience? Yes. Uh, so this conversation is about narrative building, and I think um, it's clear there's really compelling narrative around mass timber in places like Oregon, with the forest timbering opportunity we have in history with the lumber industry and forestry. And I'm curious um, what you think the most powerful narratives are. 
are in geographical regions in the US, for example, that don't have that uh, lumber economy in Eastern um, and places where might have different challenges, um, like with bugs or you know, what have you. Those related. What, what are the powerful narratives in, in different parts of the country that That's a great question. Does any, anybody on the panel want to try and take that one on before I? Take a crack at it. How do you think I about mean, that? I can take a crack at it. Just on, um, it was uh, the question was really, um, what about communities that um, don't have what Oregon has in terms of the uh, tradition of, you know, forest management and timber industry? You know, you know how, you know how are they going to sort of maybe address some of these issues? Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think okay. that's right. What's the and what's the narrative for yeah. those areas? So. I guess I can only, I, I'm just addressing this because I'm actually teaching um, an architecture studio at the University of Arkansas um, this semester. And, uh, and you know, they're actually, you know, there's a huge forest, you know, uh, you know uh, timber industry in Arkansas that, you know, I wasn't really aware of, you know. And, the, you know, Southern Pine, and they had bald cypress, the clear cut, there was a lot of old growth cypress there. But there is that tradition there, but it's very much, you know, on the commodity side, a lot of paper, a lot of things of that nature. They don't really have the, um, there's like one major glue lamp manufacturer in Arkansas, but there's a real interest in saying, how do you take, you know, Southern Yellow Pine and turn it into, um, leverage that into like a higher value product. And so one of the things that I've been doing there is really, you know, taking the students to the, um, the forest um, with the U.S. Forest Service, taking them to the actual mills, and then you know we're actually sort of starting where people are at. You know, we we're starting with like the material that's available, and it may not mean that we're gonna have, do buildings of, at first out of CLT. It might be just using you know wood in a more um, uh, thoughtful way that actually then would lead to better types of buildings, better types of experiences for people every day. So I'm just addressing that one because I am kind of been injected into it and I had no idea that there was this uh, tradition. I, I mean, I think other people, you know, might have other things to, to say. I think I would say like in certain parts of um, the country, I think it's maybe not about wood. Maybe it's just about how you think about the materials that are in your region. I don't think you know, and I think just like I, I keep coming back to food, I like food. Uh, but you know, when you. <laughs> I think you, Thomas is hungry. That's, yeah, what, that's the hungry. impression yeah. I'm starting to get. Yeah. When, when you go to a certain region, it has a sort of specialty, you know, that's maybe connected to the agricultural products that are in that region, whether one place, you know, in Arkansas, there they have a lot of, you know, hogs and, you know, that's barbecue's a big deal there. And, you know, I'm just saying, you know, you could say the same about materials, you know, in certain parts of New Mexico, things are made out of adobe because, you know, they don't have as many trees, but they have that material. So I think it's really thinking about innovation and material. And I think what is happening in, in Oregon, and I think following on what's happened elsewhere in Europe, in places where there was this raw material, people are like, well, how do I do something innovative with this great material I have? I can build on that a little bit. Um, one of the things that we found, so like in nature, our team has studied the 3.8 billion years worth of R&D and found that there are six fundamental principles that repeat, like, like nature's best practices, right? And so one of those is being resource efficient and another one is locally attuned. So when we do building design projects, one of the first things that we do is really survey the ecological intelligence of that place. and even though it may not be a Douglas fir forest that's next door, maybe it's a loblolly pine forest, there, there's always a reference habitat which people can have a relationship with. And it's understanding that relationship, understanding the ecological dynamics of that place that then connect people to either local materials, as mentioned, or other materials that can help meet the performance objectives of that ecosystem. So I think there's always a really great conversation around that connection to place, no matter what type of forest or environment that is. There's always a reference habitat that we can glean insight from that can then revert back to the, the building materials uh, conversation as well. 
Uh, there's uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, so maybe our baseball team could be like the CLT Pressers or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, I love it when forest guys do branding. It's awesome. Uh, uh, so the only answer I would have to your question, because I, I think it's you know one of the things we did today is we, we've really talked about mass timber, right? We talk about the material. Uh, the one thing I would say is. What, experience, what every piece of research on storytelling will tell you is, if there isn't a protagonist, there's no story. And, and to some extent, the material can be the protagonist, but, but and this is again, something for people in the forest sector don't like hearing, this, you're the story, right? Every individual in this room is part of this story. And if you don't have an individual as the protagonist of the story, you don't have a story. So I would just really encourage everybody here, you know, one of the reasons we said, let's do this session at the end of this, is to try and, and I think we're getting to the closing time. I want to check with Craig. You know, we're right on it, okay. Arnie's, Arnie's gonna come up and do some jujitsu with me to finish off the, the thing. Um, no, but everybody, everyone in this room is part of telling this story. We, I really do want to say, whether you want to help us tell the story as part of Forest Proud, we'd be delighted. Um, but you don't have to be a member of Forest Proud to do a, do a good job of telling your own stories. Um, so, you know, really stepping up and making sure that as you talk about um, how you're using these products, where Mass Timber is going, that, that you're taking on your individual responsibility to say, you know, I have a story to tell. Um, a and the other thing that research shows, that, and it's a great question that you asked, is that, yeah, take it local. You know, people are actually very interested in making sure that they're hearing about something in that local context. Um, that works too. So, is your video queued? Uh, I don't think it's going to queue. We can okay. we can have a anyone who wants to stay behind for more. We might show a couple of other videos that we've got going. It, it it'll be worth your time just to get this queued up. But yeah. it's a it's a pretty cool video. But a couple of quick things. One is we're here next year, right in this this spot in 2019. Like I mentioned earlier, we're looking at 2020, and we'll be talking to the to the right folks, but we're always open for input too. Don't, don't hesitate and you can reach us on uh, forestbusinessnetwork.com. There's ways to reach us, but you know, you guys all hung in here for a long time and we really appreciate it and get it, but we'll, we'll queue up a couple of videos cause they're pretty powerful if you want to see them. And then um, they're going to be accessible through uh, Will's organization to share. You know, I know I've had a lot of people ask me about sharing that information and they're, they're gonna be made available, but this is really refreshing for me. I, I really, just looking down, you know, Jim and this, this is really a cool panel. Thank you. I mean, don't you think so? I mean, this is awesome. <laughs> Thank you, panel. So, yeah, I just, uh, I kind of think we might be inviting them to the cabin and then we're going to come and drink a few beers and solve the world's problems with these guys. So, Fantastic. but I can't thank you enough. And like I said, we're going to queue up a, a video that's worth, uh, worth looking if you want to stay a couple minutes. But again, Will, thank you. And, Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, hashtag Forest Proud. Sounds good to me. Thank you for being here, everybody.